it's it goes so far back uh, and and there's truly a connection dr gerald early is our next presenter tonight dr early will discuss baseball legend jackie robinson's military court martial dr early Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I see a lot of people out here have have like pads, like y'all taking notes, <laughs> and, you know, and, and that makes me nervous, you know, because I see people taking notes. I say, oh man, I gotta maybe I gotta give an exam after this or something like that, you know. I'm not, so I hope don't take any notes on this, man. This this I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm gonna tell you a very simple story. And I've got a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you don't have to take any notes on this. Trust, trust me, you don't have to take any notes on this. In his autobiography, Knocking Down Barriers, Fighting for Black America, Truman Gibson recounts the incident that ultimately led Jackie Robinson's departure from the American military in 1944. Here is a quote from his book. Troops were transported in buses driven by white civilians who had orders to enforce the conventions of the strict segregation that ruled the South then. That meant blacks sat in the back of the bus or even at times rode in black-only buses. The drivers were sworn in as deputy sheriffs and given firearms. These pistol-packing bus drivers regularly shot black servicemen and not infrequently killed them. Robinson found himself facing one such driver at Camp Swift, Texas. Nigger, get to the back of the bus, commanded the driver. I'm getting to the back of the bus, Robinson said. Take it easy. You can't talk to me like that, the driver said. I can talk to anybody any way I want, Robinson responded. The bus driver drew a revolver, but his draw wasn't as fast as Robinson, who wrestled the pistol away and massaged the driver's mouth with it, depriving him of many teeth. <laughs> Joe Lewis called me, and I flew to Texas. But as matters turned out, I didn't have to make any arguments on Robinson's behalf. The brass at Camp Swift knew who Robinson was, apparently understood the injustice of the situation, and all likelihood reached the logical conclusion that Robinson would not put up with this kind of raw bigotry and realize only uh, more trouble lay ahead. Robinson was discharged for the good of the service with no court martial. That's the end of the quote from Mr. Gibson's book. Now, if anyone should have, should know the story of what happened to Jackie Robinson this time in the, in the U.S. Army, it should have been Truman Gibson, who was the civilian aide for the War Department at the time of the incident. <clears throat> the civilian aide job was one of the concessions blacks won from Franklin Roosevelt during the 1940 election season. In 1940, A. Philip Randolph, along with other prominent blacks, asked Roosevelt to integrate the armed forces, as well as integrate local draft boards established under the new Conscription Act, and to end discrimination in defense hiring. It is unlikely blacks would have gotten much in the way of any of these concessions had it not been an election year, one. Two, had not Stephen Early, no relation to me, Roosevelt's press secretary announced after the meeting Roosevelt had with black leaders that blacks supported keeping the military segregated, a gross distortion of their position. This angered black leaders greatly and forced the administration to seek some compromise. Matters worsened a few weeks later as Stephen Early kicked a black New York policeman in the groin who was trying to keep a police line intact to, pre to protect Roosevelt after the president had delivered a speech. This incident was played up royally in the black press. Roosevelt, not wanting to take a chance on losing a significant portion of the northern black vote, made three concessions to blacks after this concerning the military. Number one, Benjamin O. Davis would be appointed the first black brigadier general. Number two, Campbell C. Johnson would be appointed assistant to the director of the Selective Service. And number three, William Hastie would be appointed civilian aide to the Secretary of War to oversee issues involving black soldiers. William Hastie served as civilian aide from 1941 to January 1943, quitting in frustration over the military's stubbornness in changing how it treated its black personnel. Truman Gibson, who had served as Hastie's assistant, became his replacement. Gibson 
who was later to have a career as a fight promoter with ties to the mob, was considered more accommodating and less militant than Hasty, although Gibson considered himself more diplomatic and realistic. At any rate, if anyone should know the details of Robinson's military story, it should be Gibson, who was there when it happened, had read all the files about it. Yet Gibson's account does not jive with either Robinson's account or the official record. In fact, in almost every, every detail is wrong. And it's most particularly wrong in the major point, and that is he is wrong in saying that Robinson wasn't court-martialed. Robinson was indeed court-martialed. As Robinson described the incident in his first autobiography, Wait Until Next Year, Wait Till Next Year, which came out in 1960, he wrote this book with a black journalist you may have heard of named Carl Rowan. Robinson got on the bus with a black woman. Here's his version of it in his autobiography. Robinson got on the bus with a black woman who was so light-skinned she could pass for white. Apparently annoyed that a black soldier was sitting next to what he thought was a white woman, the white bus driver yelled at Robinson to move to the back of the bus, mostly because he was sitting next to a, what he thought was a white woman, rather than strictly because of where he was sitting in, you know, in the geography of the bus. Okay, so I'm quoting directly from the book now. The driver stopped the bus and walked to where Robinson and the woman sat. Listen, you, I said to get to the back of the bus where the colored people belong. Now, you listen to me, buddy. You just drive the bus and I'll sit where I please. The Army recently issued orders that there is to be no more racial segregation on any Army post. This is an Army bus operating on an Army post. And, and Robinson was right about that. You just let me tell you, buddy, said the driver. If you ain't off this bus by the time we get to the last stop, I'm going to cause you a lot of trouble. I don't care what kind of trouble you plan to cause me, snapped Robinson. You can't cause me any trouble that I haven't already faced. I know what the regulations are, and I don't intend to go to the back of this bus. So get out of my face and go drive the bus because I don't intend to be pestered by you anymore. The driver mumbled angrily as he stalked back to his seat. Okay, that's the end of what I'm quoting here. Now I'm going to sum it up in my own words. But that's, that was a direct quote from his book. When the driver reached his last stop on the post, where Robinson and his companion would have boarded a city bus, the driver left the bus and returned with three white men. One of the white women passengers on the bus began to berate Robinson, and Robinson got into an altercation with one of the white men, whom the driver had brought back with him. At this point, the military police arrived. They took him, Robinson, to see Captain Gerald M. Beard. Robinson's companion, the woman he was with, offered to accompany him, but he told her to go ahead with her trip. Robinson was questioned by uh, Captain Beard and by Beard's secretary, a civilian and a Texan, who remarked that Robinson purposely wanted to start trouble on the bus by sitting where he did. Robinson resented her questioning him and asked Beard if he had to be subjected to an interrogation by his secretary, to which Beard responded by calling him uppity, quote, uppity and out to make trouble, unquote. The secretary angrily left the room, expressing her feeling that Robinson had insulted her. Beard had Robinson sum uh, submit to a sobriety test because he thought he was drunk. Two weeks later, Robinson was charged with insubordination, disturbing the peace, conduct unbecoming an officer, insulting a civilian woman, and refusing to obey the lawful orders of a superior officer. Colonel Bates refused uh, to sign the charges, expressing the opinion that, Beard, that Captain Beard had conducted an incompetent investigation. Robinson was then transferred from Beard's battalion uh, to the 758th Tank Battalion. He was in the 751st. Uh, who, when the commander of the 758th signed the charges, several black officers, deeply concerned that Robinson was being railroaded, publicized the case as a way of protecting Robinson by notifying the NAACP and two of the leading black newspapers of the day, the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender. When this happened, Robinson was notified that several of the charges were being dropped. He was, according to his autobiography, finally court-martialed on August 2, 1944. <clears throat> but according to the Army records, he was actually court-martialed on August 3, 1944, not August 2. Uh, he was court-martialed on two charges that he had behaved disrespectfully to a superior officer, Beard, and that he had disobeyed an order from a superior officer, Beard. Colonel Bates testified on Robinson's behalf. Beard's testimony did not hold up well under cross-examination, and Robinson was acquitted. This is, this is the account that Robinson gives. 
To be sure, Robinson did not base his account merely on his memory. He formally requested a copy of his army records in April 1958, to, uh, in which he said he needed them in order to write the book, the book he, I just quoted from. Um, the Army replied in May, sending him not his records, but a one-page official statement of his military service that was full of errors. For instance, incorrectly stating that he was discharged in January 27, 1943, which was actually the date, January 28, 1943, that he was commissioned as a second lieutenant. Um, which was noted in the letter, actually, that he was commissioned as a second lieutenant. This means that according to the letter that the Army gave him, he was discharged first and then given his commission, which is impossible. <laughs> he was court-martialed in 1944, as I said above. Uh, in June, Robinson uh, desperately requested, repeated his request, and the Army responded by sending him a copy of his general court-martial orders. Now, there are three types of courts martial. When you say, when you want to say plural, you say courts martial. A summary court-martial is for minor offenses, which usually, if the defendant is found guilty, is he gets a reduction in pay and possibly a short-term confinement of 30 to 60 days. A special court-martial is for more serious offenses when the, enlist, when the defendant can request a jury composed one-third of enlisted men or can request to be tried solely by a judge. The maximum penalties for a special court-martial are loss of two-thirds of your pay for one year and possible confinement of up to a year. Finally, there is a general court-martial, which are for the most serious charges. Punishments can include death for treason or desertion of duty under fire. Um, you can have a multiple-year confinement, and you can be dishonorably discharged or given a bad conduct discharge. Robinson had a general court-martial, the most serious kind. And had he been convicted, he almost certainly would have been dishonorably discharged from the service, which would have made, it, made his later Major League Baseball career impossible, because Ricky would not have chosen had he been dishonorably discharged from the military. In his second autobiography, I Never Had It Made, which came out in 1972, Robinson gives the same story, only a little bit shorter, but it's basically the same story. Okay, the official records. Reading the official depositions of all the witnesses and actors in the incident that led to Robinson's court-martial, a few things become clear. First, it was nearly a certainty that the bus driver, Milton N. Renegard, was not armed. Robinson almost certainly would have been shot if the bus driver had been, as he likely would have used his weapon and Robinson would likely not have been able to disarm him. Nowhere in the court record is it mentioned that the bus driver was armed. Moreover, I am convinced that Robinson would have been shot had the bus driver been armed because the driver, as well as several of the other witnesses, make it plain in their depositions that they thought Robinson had been disrespectful to white women. First, he talked back to and allegedly cursed a white woman passenger on the bus who objected to his behavior and said that she was going to report him to the MPs. Second, he was asked to move to the back of the bus in part because several white women and their children were boarding the bus, and the driver particularly didn't want the white women and children who were boarding the bus to mix with him and his black companion. That's the major reason why they wanted him to go to the back of the bus. Um, uh, the sexual aspect of this is, is especially explosive, which is why I believe that Robinson would have been shot or assaulted if the driver had been armed. In the deposition of the whites, of all the whites who, I read all the depositions of all the whites, the white women uh, present at the incident are in all the deposition records are always referred to, quote, as ladies, unquote. And the black woman who was with Robinson, Virginia Jones, wife of a, uh, of a black first lieutenant, is always referred to, quote, as a colored girl, unquote. The racial hierarchical distinctions are clearly delineated in the language of the depositions. Robinson, was clear, Robinson himself was clearly incensed. This is the other major point that's clear in the, in the records. Robinson was clearly incensed by somebody calling him a nigger or something that he has heard or thought he heard as nigger. Robinson at one point said to Captain Peeler Wigington, one of the white officers who questioned him after he was taken into custody, he said, quote, any captain, any private, you, or any general calls me a nigger, I will break you in two, unquote. 
all parties, including Robinson, agreed that this was said. So everybody in all the depositions, including Robinson himself, said that he said this. Okay. Um, Robinson clearly saw the whole incident of what was happening to him as an assault on his black manhood. After being taken into custody and vigorously and counterproductively arguing his side of the story, Robinson became convinced that the white officers in the room were mounting a conspiracy against him, which they probably were, because their depositions all matched incredibly well, and that he would not get justice. The fact that Robinson was acquitted had much to do not so much with the strength or weaknesses of the prosecution's case, but rather that Robinson was somebody, not a nobody. He had been a star college athlete, and his brother, Mac, had been on the 1936 Olympic track and field team. Robinson knew Joe Lewis, who used his influence to help him. Robinson wrote letters to powerful people and had letters written on his behalf, some of which can be found in the record. In a July 1944 telephone conversation between Colonel Kimball of Camp Hood, it didn't happen at Camp Swift, that's another thing that, that Gibson got wrong, it happened at Camp Hood, Texas. Um, and Colonel uh, Blewett of, uh, 20, of the 23rd Corps, it is clear that the Army's top brass was aware of the hot potato they were trying to handle. Kimball said, quote, this case is full of dynamite and requires very delicate handling, unquote. Kimball wanted an outside inspector for the case, afraid that all the men at Camp Hood would be prejudiced. Blewett said that he, had, that he has no inspector immediately available, but would send one as soon as possible. So Robinson, which eventually he did, so Robinson was acquitted probably because it was the most expedient way for the army to get rid of him without making him a martyr or a cause to leave for the black American leadership. And so in that respect, Truman Gibson was right, that he was kicked out of the army. Eventually he was, he was honorably discharged to get rid of him from the army because his standing up the way he did was too um, was too too much for the army to deal with at that time. Thank you so much. We've heard it all. Um, thank you, Dr. Early. Uh, we we've, we've talked about the mood of the country and and the Lincoln administration prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. We've heard a little bit about uh, how people. Uh, dealt with it once we had the Emancipation Proclamation and what life was like and education of the yeah. newly freed slaves and their, their offspring and, and bringing us right up to the present and then the story of a great American um, and, and his struggles with racism and discrimination in our country. All of that presented to you tonight by very gifted individuals now we'd like to offer you the opportunity to ask questions of them based on comments. Um, we will take a few. I don't know how much longer. Five minutes? I'm sorry. Okay. We'll, we'll do 30 minutes of, of questions. So anyone? Um, yes, sir. Would you stand and, and, and give us your, your, your loud voice? We don't have a microphone, I don't think. My question is, uh, goes to Mr. Uh, John, uh, John Stockton. He is a professor at Harvard University. And in his book, he contends that one person missing from that picture was Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. But Frederick Douglass basically met with Lincoln three or four times. He, he was a staunch advocate all his life uh, for freedom. Two of his sons fall in the 54th uh, president. And I want to ask the panelists about his contribution to freeing uh, uh, African American slaves. Anyone in particular you'd like? Uh, the the, the prince, the, with the picture, uh, would yeah. you, did you have any comments? Yeah, uh, the picture was just, of course, of Lincoln's cabinet. Uh, Douglas, of course, was an early advocate of raising black troops and uh, was, and long before Lincoln decided to do it, was very actively pursuing that in his speeches and stuff around the country. Um, and um, yeah, he had a major a major role to play uh, in, in moving the whole, the whole prospect forward. And one of the things that we have to remember is that there were politics were involved back then just as there are now 
And one of the reasons that Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation was that Congress was getting ahead of him. Congress had already abolished slavery in the District of Columbia. Congress had said that the, the Army had no obligation to enforce the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. Uh, Congress was, had passed two confiscation acts that kind of were the entering wedge toward emancipation. And so one of the reasons Lincoln moved forward, and, and Douglas had been involved in pushing all of that forward, uh, one of the reasons Lincoln uh, moved with the presidential uh, proclamation was to try to get ahead of the issue and get himself back in the forefront of it. Any other comment about uh, Frederick Douglass and uh, his contribution to the, um, the writing of the proclamation? Okay. All right. Sir, your question. And there is a microphone, I'm told. It's working. Uh, Dr. Earl, just, just briefly, quickly. Uh, my picture of Dr. Robinson was a bit different from what I heard tonight. You know, Brent Ricky chose him for the managers and also on being able to withstand what might come upon But the story here tonight is a little different. Can you kind of bring this up to date on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Jackie Robinson was, was had a hair trigger temper. He was an extremely competitive man. He was a quite driven man, and he could not stand uh, taking any kind of insult from white people. Now, what he did in the first three years he was in Major League Baseball was because Grant Ricky asked him to do that. It wasn't because it was the way he was. In fact, he wrote this book, he felt like a freak when he had to do that because that wasn't him. And when he got freed up from that, you'll notice if you read about him, if he got, when he got freed up from that, he became very uh, outspoken on the field, very argumentative, and, 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 the, and the white folks who loved him the first three years when he was like Mahatma Gandhi, he suddenly started getting a lot of bad press from white sports writers afterwards because they kept saying, oh, He's too sensitive. He's too temperamental. He's always jumping out here arguing with people and all this sort of stuff. But that was the way Jackie Robinson was. And that was one of the reasons why but Jackie Robinson, you know, he had, he had a lot of pride. He had a lot of race pride. And he was very competitive. So that made him, you know, the kind of person that he was. For instance, that's one of the reasons why he and Roy Campanella did not get along that well on, on the Dodgers. Because he thought Roy didn't have enough race wasn't interested in race enough, didn't have enough race pride the way he did and stuff like that. So, you know, the picture you got Jackie Robinson tonight is Jackie Robinson. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add something to that. You know, I think it's safe to say that historically, yeah. we have been fed a manipulated image of Jackie Robinson. And, you know, the, I'm looking forward to the book. Let me just say this, in the interest of recording this event, if you have a response, could you come to the microphone or else I'll have to bring the microphone to you? It'd be easier if they came to the podium. All right, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, well, my question, I believe, will be to, to uh, Dr. Gergen. I think uh, you stated uh, that Governor Gamble, uh, he made a term of when, when the children could not become slaves. What was his thought process behind it? Because what I get from that is that he agreed that, OK, uh, slavery was bad or whatever. I mean, why? Why would he say, okay, after 10 years? You're, you're talking about Hamilton Gamble, the, the governor? Uh, well, he was pro-slavery. Uh, and uh, what Lincoln was trying to do with the border states, those, those, those states that we saw across from Delaware and so forth, they didn't secede from the Union. Uh, and uh, they were slave states. And Lincoln, in the early years of the war, said, okay, we'll let you deal with slavery however you want. He encouraged them to a move in the direction of emancipation. And that's what Hamilton Gamble was doing. But he was, what I was trying to point out was that if he had his way, uh, he, the, the slave owners would have continued to have control of the labor power of their servants, as they were now being called, uh, for another generation or more. I mean, he wasn't, slavery wasn't going to end until the late 19th century if Hamilton Gamble had his way.
Does that does that help uh, answer? Okay. So there are, the border state uh, loyal slaveholders are really hoping in uh, the fact that they didn't accept the compensated emancipation indicates to me that they really hoped that they could hold on to slavery for quite a bit longer. Um, is this working? Okay. Um, yes, and, and in real life they did. I, I'm saying this just because I sat up late <coughs> in the night this week watching the program on PBS called Slavery by Any Other Name about basically uh, as they call it, peonage, and the convict labor that went on for decades and decades, and we still have had it um, in, in recent years as well. And it's a huge industry in, in our country. The prisons. Um, I, the, I really want to recommend that film and the other films that are happening for African American History Month on PBS, and also there's a Black Women's American History and Culture theme for the St. Louis Public Library System in each of the different branches, or several of the different branches. And it's, um, I have the program here, I've been going to some of them, and it was launched, in fact, <laughs> by Priscilla, in, in my, in my uh, awareness. I also wanted to say that Lynn, um, Jackson, in her usual modest way, did not mention her magnificent coloring book um, <laughs> about uh, her wonderful and very magnificent uh, ancestors. And also, so I have a copy of that on me, which I never leave home without. <laughs> and and do you have, did, did you have your, any that you were wanted to share tonight? I didn't bring them because it's a book. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you. She said she didn't bring them because this is a different program. Right, right. And, and thank you, though, for bringing it to our attention. But also as a library director myself, I want to promote yet another wonderful librarian who is um, Ruth Ann Hager, who did the Dread and Herod Scott family story and the phenomenal research that was almost a thriller to watch when she did the uh, um, slideshow about trying to find out about the family and also about where Harriet Scott was buried. Thank you. Thank you. It, yes, ma'am. We have a question. We'll take this uh, young lady and then the gentleman here. I just wanted to ask Ms. Jackson. For, for many years, all we heard uh, about the Dred Scott case was dread. And it's only been in the last few years that <clears throat> come out that Harriet and Red filed separate suits, uh, almost identical. Um, could you elaborate on was Harriet really the one pushing her older husband, or do you know? Okay, that I can't say for positive sure, but I always go back to the fact that if you know the women in our family, genetically speaking, she definitely had an opinion about what they should do. But you know, I appreciate you asking that because it gives me an opportunity to tag on to what Reverend Scott was saying, that um, the pastor, Reverend John Anderson, was a free abolitionist black man. And we believe that he taught them the ins and outs on how it was that since their owner didn't let them buy their freedom, which they had offered to do, that they could then sue for their freedom in the courts. And because Herod had been in the same free territory as Dredd in Fort Snelling, and he had also been in uh, Illinois, that they had the once free, always free rule that allowed them to do this. And so by virtue of her own situation, she decided, I'm sure, that she should file for her own freedom. But also it's important to remember that so goes the mother, so goes the child. So if she had won her case, then she and her daughters would be free, even if Dredd did not. But they were willing to at least get three-fourths of the family free, as opposed to nobody being free. And so they did file, both of them, on April 6th of 1846 at the Oak Courthouse. And their first trial was a mistrial because of hearsay. And then the second trial they had, they were literally giving their freedom there by a jury of 12 white men. So we, we can't prove that. But there is a book called Mrs. Dred Scott by attorney Lee Vanderbilt, uh, Lee Vanderbilt of Ohio, I'm sorry, Iowa. 
And uh, it's a thick book. Half of it is um, bibliography, but the first half, she tries to make a case for that. And so somewhere in there, um, she feels that that's the case. And I think this is where this has come from, for the most part. But yes, she definitely had grounds. And I think she had the personality. And I think she had the motive. Thank you for the question. And could you clear up the, the Catholic comment? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's very adamant about that. OK, no, Dredd was not Catholic. He was not. Um, chances are he went to church with Harriet. And I say that because even though her name, I believe, is the only one in their records, if you were to go and read the eulogy that James Milton Turner wrote and read in 1882, when they had the color portrait of Dredd, which is in the old, I'm sorry, it's in the Missouri History Museum on third floor. It's that color portrait that's on my book. That picture was, uh, was dedicated, and Milton Turner did the eulogy. In that eulogy, he said, that Dredd was among those prominent notables, such as Reverend John Anderson, Reverend Meacham, and, and others. I think he named three or four people who were diligent to care for the poor and the indigent and to, to look after their welfare. So he named him among four other pastors, the pastor of that church. And so by virtue of deductive reasoning, one might presume that he went to that church. But he certainly was also a Christian as well. So. To that end, okay, so he goes to your church, but he's buried in Calvary Cemetery. And Calvary, of course, is a beautiful Catholic cemetery. He was first, however, buried at Wesleyan Cemetery. And Wesleyan it was at Grand and Lindell, where St. Louis University is. And uh, there was a time that came when they said they were going to abandon that. And the Blow family, who had always been there for them, said, well, we, we're going to move him. So they had to buy two plots at Calvary. And that meant that Dredd, being black, couldn't be buried next to a white person. So if you go there now, you'll, you won't see another headstone real close to his. He's on the side of the road. But he was reinterred there because they did not want to lose him. And so he's in a Catholic cemetery, but he himself was not Catholic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question here, this gentleman on this side of the room. Here with uh, Dr. Dowden White. Okay. <laughs> uh, I heard you mention at the tail end of your uh, presentation stocks for Mississippi, and I was just wondering what impact did the Great Migration have on St. Louis public education? Thank you for the the question. Uh, the Great Migration had a tremendous impact on. Um, education in in St. Louis and on St. Louis uh, as a whole I mean, in, in, in so many areas the Great Migration had a tremendous impact. Um, as you probably know St. Louis was during the interwar period during the first leg of the Great Migration around the First World War period uh, was one of the major centers of the Great Migration. And it was also um, a major center of, of in-migration into, into the city. I found in my early research, um, when I was working on my dissertation, um, in some weeks in 1922, there were some weeks when there were approximately a 1,000 African Americans that were moving into into St. Louis. Now what was somewhat different about the impact of the Great Migration on education in St. Louis, unlike cities to the north, <coughs> Chicago, if we go up in Pennsylvania, and those cities, where in those northern, more northern cities, they had had at least some semblance of racial segregation in their public schools. St. Louis had always maintained segregated schools. And so where you have in those northern cities what one historian who wrote on education and public schooling in Chicago referred to as down from equality, and that's the title of his book, um, as a result of the Great Migration. In St. Louis, you just have a steady entrenchment of 
of um, racial segregation, not only in the, in the schools, um, but in, in the healthcare field and in other, in other um, arenas of, of social welfare reform in, in St. Louis. Question in the back of the room. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, Lynn Jackson and I are families. Uh, we are friends for years now. We admire her and her leadership on the Dred Scott Foundation. Uh, but we've heard and have seen the models of the statue of Dred and Harriet. Uh, very well done. They are to be placed, we understand, at the old courthouse. I'd like to know the progress of that uh, movement where we are and what can we do to help. <laughs> thank you, Harold and Joan. You guys are precious. Thank you. I have a lot of you know, unpaid PR people in the room, as you can tell. <laughs> thank you. Uh, real quick, though, uh, the progress is that we are right at halfway of, uh, of the funds that's required for the statue. But the statue is also underway, and well underway. We expect to see it sometime this year. And ideally, um, you know, if we could just finish raising the money for that, we'd be real happy. But we're going to get it in this year, I'm pretty positive. The uh, sculptor is Harry Weber, and you'll know him from Albert Pujols, Lou Brock, Kurt Gibson. I mean, did I say it wrong? What's his name? Bob Gibson. I love him. <laughs> Bob Gibson. I'm thinking of Kurt Flood, yeah. Um, and, just, uh, you know, many other people. Chuck Berry just recently wonderful sculptor and beautiful, he's done a beautiful job on Dredd and Harriet. So, um, you know, I'll, I, I don't think I can solicit funds tonight, but if you go to our website and you just Google the Dred Scott Foundation, you'll get all the information you need on that, and I thank you. All right, we have uh, another question on this side of the room, young lady. Um, I have a question for Dr. Don White. Uh, I go to Village Inn, and I was wondering when the private uh, Catholic schools were first integrated. You know, my research um, has not dealt a great deal with private schooling. And that is a, a topic that I am aware that there is some current scholarship that's underway. Um, in there's a, a and I can't now, I can't think of where this student is, but I recently, a few months ago, I heard about a student who is working on a dissertation on private schooling in St. Louis. So unfortunately, I, I can't address that. My research deals with, with public schooling um, in, in St. Louis. I, I just wanted to just take a, uh, opportunity to just say something else to this gentleman who had asked me this this mm -hmm. question earlier. Um, what what I didn't have time to really elaborate on in terms of those local school movements really further answers your question about the impact of the Great Migration uh, on schooling in in St. Louis. One of the things that occurs by the the mid to to late twenties as the demographics, as the racial demographics of these neighborhoods are changing as a result of the impact of black residents moving into predominantly white, formerly all white um, areas, is that these once colored schools now become, these once white schools become colored schools. And one of the things that's really interesting about what happens when when these schools become colored schools, often the African American uh, representatives will petition the board to have the names changed to reflect those names of African American heroes. And you may be surprised that something that seems, you know, so non political would just, you know, elicit a firestorm. Uh, within some of the, the white communities. And so you have all of these struggles around the name changes of, of schools. And there was one um, example, um, and the students, this was the Glasgow School, the original Glasgow School that was changed to Paul Lunch Dunbar. 
and I have not been able to find a photograph of this. I know that someone had to take a photograph of this, but the newspapers actually talked about how the white students of Glasgow actually went on strike and they had posters with their parents and on the posters it would say, Glasgow forever, Dunbar never. Now they didn't win that battle. But, um, it, you know, there are plenty of examples like that. And, um, you know, I read in and I heard in Dr. Early's um, bio that he is promoting his book. I actually brought my book with me. <laughs> and I was going to let everyone know that they are available. I, I would just say that the reverse of that happened, too, having, yes. having fought at Sumner. 566, Mr. Brantley, the principal, was very quick to tell me that integration was the ruin of Sumner High School oh. um, because from that point on, the very strong community that they had, from that point, students were allowed to go wherever they wanted. And th I mean, that was his theory. There's a question in the back, the young man there, and then Mr. Sieber. I have a question. Well, I'm not going to talk about how to tackle it right now. We could talk about that later, but I will say something about the cause of it, and it's connected to um, this young lady's observation that this, this teacher made, which I actually disagree with. Um, I, no, I, I understand that. But there, it, there and, that, and that's not to say that I don't acknowledge that the structural concerns of racial segregation actually led to a cohesiveness in the African American community. But it is my view that even during Sumner's heyday, the foundation of segregated schooling was undermining African American education and the St. Louis public schools in general, even in its heyday. We couldn't see it yet. We couldn't see it yet. But we are still dealing with these decisions that our foreparents made in the 19th century to segregate our school system. And of course, it is connected, it is intimately connected, the problem of schools is intimately connected with where we live, housing. And that's why it's such a booger bear for us to, to work on. Thank you. I'll speak loud. Uh, in, in response, partial response to the young lady's question about when private schools Integrated. I don't know about private schools, but the, par the parochial schools the, um, were uh, technically desegregated by um, Ritter, 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 Cardinal Ritter, Ritter in, in 1948. Mm -hmm. And how much that actually accomplished, I don't know, but that was when that specifically happened for just the archdiocesan schools. Comment? Any other comments or questions? Oh, here's a hand, and then we'll come over. I see this gentleman again. Yes. yes. Um, and this can go to any of you guys, but I go to Lumber High School, and we we were just discussing um, the different like um, how it's called, but we were just talking about Booker T. Washington and W. E. Du Bois and their <coughs> different views on like how to get equality for African Americans. And I was just wondering if any of you guys had. The interesting thing is that within the uh, social constructs when it comes to um, educating anybody about African-American history is that they try to create 
this um, dichotomy between Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois. The interesting thing is that Booker T. Washington, of course, was more uh, looked at the use of hand, efficiency, whereas W.B. Du Bois had the concept of talent to tent. The interesting thing is that neither was, one is not better than the other. It takes an embracing of the both. And so uh, part of what I've helped my students or my parishioners to understand is that you need to be able to, if you're African-American or African descent, you need to be able to use your hand as well as your brain and um, engage in whatever uplift you can to improve the community and transform those spaces into reconciliation and liberation. Any other comments from our panel? Well, I'd just make one. Years ago, August Meyer wrote a, a book about uh, African-American thought in the United States, and he made the point, which I, I think we oftentimes forget when Booker T. Washington is uh, described as an accommodationist, that he was developing uh, the boycott movement in the South using the economic power of African-Americans, which became the cutting edge of the modern civil rights movement. So. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, well, I just wanted to point out that uh, Isabel Wilson, who was writer for New York Times, wrote a book called uh, Warmth, the Other Sun. She was here last year. Mm -hmm. She was here last year. If you want to read a great book about the Great Migration, I'm sure there are a lot of other resources out there that the panel might know about. Uh, but she said there were 8 million African Americans who left the South, and they went by various train routes depending on where they lived in the South. And they went to Florida, they went to New York and New Jersey. We live in Alabama, Georgia. They came by train to St. Louis, Chicago. And those in Texas and Louisiana went to uh, uh, California and the West. So it's just a resource. The other thing was, I'm a physician, and the brain controls the hand. And so that anybody who has mechanical ability, it came from his brain. The hand doesn't have a brain by itself. And thirdly, I am from Kansas City, Kansas, in Quindera. And when I grew up, Kansas was a free state. Lawrence, Kansas was the center of the anti-abolitionist movement. There's a statue of John Brown, very close to where I grew up, near the, uh, in Quindera, Kansas. And as you know, John Brown uh, was, was a, a staunch advocate uh, for, uh, you know, black people be, being able to be free. So I grew up with stories about uh, Quantrill and, the, and, the, and the, the raiders coming across bloody Kansas in our history. But I also knew that uh, Kansas was a free state. There's a place called Nicodemus, which is on the National Historic Register. It's an all black town. There were many black towns and, and, uh, established by homesteading in uh, Kansas. And so I wanted to say that, that basically, uh, depending on, on your history, our history was that I'm from a free state. Now, it may have been, and I also am from a state where the Brown versus Board of Education was also passed in the peak of Kansas. So, I'm fortunate to have had. I'm also from Sumner High School in Kansas City, Kansas. <laughs> I want you to know that there's a Sumner High School in the state of Washington. It's an all-white school. Sumner High School was, a, was a, a prominent name around the country. I was really flabbergasted. One of my classmates from medical school finished from Sumner High School in Sumner, Washington. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Um, any other uh, questions or comments? Oh. We're getting bigger. Uh, we're spreading out. Well, you're, you're right here in the front. And this young lady here. Then we've got a question by the camera. And then we'll come back to this gentleman who's asked the question already. Good evening, everyone. I wanted to ask if any one of the panelists can address uh, if you know the origin of the <coughs> bill. L.P.L. High was named. And also, Dr. White, I wanted to know, did you mention anything about Elementary school being hostile in the grounds of a high school. When I was speaking about the elementary school, uh, the movement to place a new elementary school on Vashon's grounds, it actually did not occur. But the, the issue was um, that there was nationwide within the education movement this new idea that was floating around about how to socialize young people, how to socialize children. And so there were these new experiments that were taking place. And 
Um, the, the board had made an argument that by putting an elementary school, the new elementary school that was needed on the grounds of Vashon, that this could be an example of this new experiment in socialization. Well, as you can imagine, um, those who were opposed to this, which of course was not only the black community, but some of, 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 of the white community who also agreed with them, um, argued that this was not good to have elementary school age children with high school age children, um, you know, in intimate contact with uh, one another. And so what the African American representatives argued, they said, well, if you're going to do this with the black schools, separate but equal, you have to, in the measure of equivalency, you have to do it with the white schools. And so this is why it became a citywide issue. And it went to court, and, and, and it was decided that, that it would not um, occur. Now, you had a question before that. About uh, Deville, because Georgia had named Ellertsville. I would ask it's, it's Ellertsville. Ellertsville. It's Ellertsville. And it was named after uh, a, a horticulturalist uh, named Charles Ellertsville, a white horticulturalist named Charles Ellerts. And um, in, in the 1880s, Charles Ellerts settled that, began to settle that, that area. Uh, by the time we get into the first and the second decade of the 20th century, the veal has become predominantly black. And the reason why the veal becomes an anchor, an institutional anchor for the black community, when you look at this westward movement of African Americans from the riverfront as they become more upwardly mobile, better, you know, beyond making do. If you know anything about the housing stock and the, and the history of the housing stock in the Veal neighborhood, there was a disproportionately large number of houses that are called shotgun style houses and frame houses. Now, there, there are brick homes that are old that are still in the Veal, but the, the the primary housing was small. And there were very few race restrictive covenants that were contracted in the veal because whites did not fight to hold on to the veal. There was some racial, some racial friction, but whites did not fight to really hold on to that area. Now, if you go outside of the veal, out, the outskirts where you have the larger brick homes, you will find race restrictive covenants. And so that was an area that African Americans found that they were unencumbered by the race restrictive covenants. And so it becomes this solidly working class and professional class community. Now there's a myth that it, it's where all of the black elite live, but that's not true. But it was a solid working class and professional class uh, community. Thank you. Uh, and this gentleman, we're going to take these last two questions and we'll wrap up. If you have any other additional comments, you can approach the panelists individually. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. The question is primarily aimed uh, at Ms. Jackson, but I think any panelist, um, their comments would be very helpful. Um, I was very impressed with your foundation, and my understanding is that it's dedicated to history, education, and reconciliation. And I think that um, history and education are very important, and I think that reconciliation is perhaps the most important and also the most tricky of those three concepts. I think that um, we could address the relationship between history, between the past, and between reconciliation and the present. So do you have um, either stories or examples of reconciliation that you've observed, um, or suggestions for how we could walk away having a firmer concept on what that means in our everyday life? Well, yes, um, that last part of your question really did uh, get my antenna up. Uh, two things. One, it's commemoration, education, and reconciliation. 
And when I was, um, you know, kind of like it was downloaded to me that this is what it should be, and I figured, okay, I understand commemoration. We're going to do this 150th, and education is a no-brainer. But reconciliation, I said, oh, my gosh, what's that going to turn out to be? I don't have a clue. But as I've gone through the last five or six years, it's unfolding and unveiling itself to me as to where that will probably lead. However, um, one of the things that happened during this um, process, uh, the year of the decision, the anniversary, 2007, there was, um, there was an opportunity for the Southern Baptists to do something very special. They presented to me three separate resolutions at their state level, the local level, and the national level of a resolution to um, acknowledge the Dred Scott decision was wrong and that they would do all that they could to undo the harm that had been done and work for reconciliation. And uh, those three resolutions that I have um, are very precious to me because that's very unusual and uh, the wording is, is just beautiful and unique. But that's a national movement of a religious order who at one time was, you know, obviously pro-slavery to say that in this day and age we're willing to do something different. And then uh, one last thing is that uh, among the many groups that I've spoken to and, uh, and some of the wonderful little societies that exist in the city that most people don't know about, and uh, the president of one of them is in the room tonight, but one is the Daughters of the American Revolution. And if you don't recall, this is the group that said that Marian Anderson was not welcome to sing for them at Constitution Hall. And so, um, as that story goes, which is a really good story, is that uh, the president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, said, oh, that's fine, I'm resigning, and you come with me. And she took her to the uh, Lincoln Memorial, and she sang for 12,000 people. Well, the daughters of the Daughters of the American Revolution, who exists here now in St. Louis, have had me at their home for presentation, and they've given a donation to the statue. They also are working to uh, promote the legacy of Marian Anderson, where, where they are. So these are the little things that you don't hear about but are awesome and wonderful. And it's happening. It's a groundswell that it's just going to burst out one day and all of a sudden it's going to be there. So I really appreciate that question. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, in, the, uh, in the interest of time, we will conclude our comments in, in our program. But certainly if you want to approach our panelists, uh, feel free to do so if they have time for a, uh, a few more comments. Again, we'd like to say thank you to all of the speakers tonight. Uh, would you give them a round of applause, please? And also want to thank a, the St. Louis African American History and Genealogy Society for partnering in promoting this event. And there have been, in case you noticed, uh, there were four or five young people who volunteered to help and serve as hostesses. We want to say thank you to them for being a part of the program tonight. <laughs> Mr. Sieber. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Cornute, panel members, Mrs. Jackson and Reverend Scott, for this wonderfully informative and thought-provoking evening. As a, as a small token of our gratitude for your making this program possible, we'd like you to accept um, some certificates of appreciation as a reminder of our time together, and uh, I would like to present those now. Thank you very much. Jackson, in the order of your presentation. Thank you. Scott. Kirtage, thank you. <laughs> Vincent. Can you can you announce the conference Saturday that Rand, that Wanda's speaking at at Harris Maybe. Stone? And I think uh, our friend uh, Dr. Early Lex. <laughs> thank you everyone for your participation, and uh, please check our website for our future uh, programs in uh, April and May. Thank you.